A Treatise on Foreign Teas by Hugh Smith Advertisements Dr. Solander's Sanative English Tea Universally approved and recommended by the most eminent physicians In preference to foreign tea as the most pleasing and powerful restorative in all nervous disorders hitherto discovered. Our first element at breakfast, being designed to recruit the waste of the body from the night's insensible perspiration, an inquiry is important whether India tea, which the faculty unanimously concur in pronouncing a species of slow poison, that unnerves and wears the substance of the solids, is adequate to such a purpose. If it be not, the inquiry is further necessary to find out a proper substitute. If an apozem, professionally approved and recommended for its nutritive qualities as a general element, has claimed to public attention, certainly Dr. Solander's tea, so sanctioned, is the most proper morning and afternoon's beverage, prepared for the proprietor by an eminent botanist, sold wholesale and retail by the proprietor's agent, Mr. T. Golding, at his warehouse for patent medicines, number 42 Cornhill, London, and retail by Mr. F. Newberry, number 45 St. Paul's Churchyard, Messrs. Bailey's Coxpur Street, Mr. W. Bacon, number 150 Oxford Street, Mr. Overton, number 47 New Bond Street, and by Mr. J. Fuller, south side of Convent Garden. Also by the vendors of patent medicines in most cities and towns in England, ireland and scotland sold in packets at two shillings nine pence and in canisters at ten shillings six pence each duty included liberal allowance for exportation to country vendors and to schools the native and exotic plants which chiefly compose dr solander's tea being gathered and dried with peculiar attention to the preserving of their sanative virtues must render them far more efficacious than many similar preparations, which by being reduced to powder must have those qualities destroyed they might otherwise possess. A packet of this tea at two shillings nine pence is sufficient to breakfast one person a month. Advertisement to the Foreign Teas Having in the preceding inquiry traced from the system of the nerves that on their state the health of the constitution chiefly depends, our immediate concern is next to ascertain what kind of food we either adopt from choice, custom, or necessity is the most likely to destroy the economy of the nerves. And as foreign teas have long been censured as being the cause of many disorders which arise from the nerves being disarranged or debilitated, an impartial inquiry is here made into the nature, preparation, and effects of these teas. By this investigation, it will appear that teas imported from China and India are the most injurious of any beverage that can possibly be taken as a general and constant aliment. But not prematurely to anticipate any part of the following subject, the reader is most respectfully referred to the following pages for further evidence. End of section one. Introduction as two of the four meals that form our daily subsistence are chiefly composed of tea, an inquiry into what kind is the most salutary must be as necessary as it may prove interesting and beneficial. For on the choice of proper or improper tea must greatly depend the health or disease of the public in general. To this may be attributed the constitution being either preserved from that innumerable train of afflictions which arise from too great a relaxation of the nervous system by acute distempers, misfortunes, etc., or being so debilitated by excessive drinking of India tea as to render it alone the prey of melancholy, palsies, epilepsies, nightmares, swoonings, flatulencies, low spirits, hysteric and hypochondriacal affections. For tea that is pernicious is not only poison to those who, from any cause of corporal debility or mental affliction, are liable to the above diseases, but it is also too frequently found to render the most healthy victims of these alarming complaints. And, as nervous disorders are the most complicated in their distressing circumstances, the greater care should be taken to avoid such aliments as produce them, as well as to choose those which are the most proper for their relief and prevention. Those who are now suffering from the inconsiderate use of improper tea, 
What pitiable objects of distress and disease do they not represent for the caution of those who may timely preserve themselves? Nervous disorders are the most formidable by being the most numerous in their attacks upon the human frame. Every moment, comparatively speaking, produces some new distress of mind or body. The imagination cannot avoid the horrors of its own creation, while the memory is harassed with the shadows of departed pleasures which serve but to increase the pain of existing torments. All the endearments of life are vanished to the poor wretch who sees himself surrounded by the specters of dismay, terror, despondency, and melancholy. And such is but the thousandth part of the afflictions that are to be avoided or produced by the choice of the prevailing beverage of tea. Not only the innumerable train of nervous afflictions, but all those disorders that arise from an improper temperature of the fluids may be produced from the action, corrosion, and stimulation of pernicious teas. In proportion to the state of the fluids, in particular constitutions, they may either prove too relaxing or astringent, too condensing or attenuating, and too acrid or viscid. For India teas, that to some constitutions are very diluting, may produce in others contrary effects. Therefore, such should be chosen as possess a combination of quality that may render them, as nearly as possible, to a general specific. But this cannot be well expected where one single ingredient is used, and that is distinguished for its particular qualities which, if wholesome, can only be such to those whose fluids are so, by nature or circumstances, as to require such a particular assistant, for to every other state of the fluids they must be pernicious. It is consequently evident that if teas imported from India have any virtues, they cannot be such as to render them worthy of being universally adopted as a general aliment. If wholesome to a few, they must be pernicious to the rest of mankind, with whose constitutions they have no congeniality, medicinal, or alimentary virtue. Supposing they may possess some physical properties, like all other medicines, they can only benefit such disorders as nature particularly formed them to relieve. Those who have been advocates for their positive virtues have, in this instance, but more confirmed the impropriety of adopting them as a general morning and evening beverage. This only explains more evidently the cause of so many being injured, where one is benefited by drinking constantly India tea. There cannot possibly be stated a more self-evident proposition than where any simple or combined matter is adopted for a particular purpose. It must, in every opposite instance, prove injurious. In proportion, therefore, to such particular qualities, they are the more improper to be generally and indiscriminately adopted. This observation, although it may be applied to every art or science, is still more applicable to physic. Thus, it is found that no medicine can be safely taken as a constant and general aliment. Even those who at first might find it beneficial in their respective complaints have too frequently found the constant use of it afterwards hurtful to the constitution it had before relieved. It may be deduced from the above considerations that India teas, however physically beneficial, to allow them all their best of praise, must be as an aliment generally injurious. Instead of preserving health, they sow innumerable disorders which can only be cured by substituting a beverage from such salutary native or exotic herbs as are formed for the particular afflictions the former have so pitiably brought upon the too greater part of mankind. As almost every disorder to which the human frame is liable may be retarded in its cure, if not confirmed in the constitution by the power of secretion being weakened, India teas are the most dangerous that can be possibly used as a general beverage. By too much dilating the canals, the concussive force of the sides is increased, which destroys the oscillatory motion, and thus are the secretions altered and disturbed. And as the action of medicines consists in removing impediments to the equal motion of the fluids, the greater care should be taken to abstain from all food or drink that may increase those impediments. That India teas not only increase but occasion such evils is evident, from their having been experienced to relax the tone and reduce the consistence of the solids. As the powers of secretion depend upon the just equilibrium of force between the solids and the liquids, the latter must, in the above instance, make a greater impetus upon one part than another, from which proceeds that morbid state so justly and emphatically termed disease. Thus, according to the learned Bohov, to heal is to take away the disease from the body. 
that is, to remove and expel the causes which hinder the equal motion or transflux. Medicines, he says, are those mechanical instruments by which an artist may remove the causes of the balance being destroyed, and thus reinstate the lost equilibrium of solids and liquids. He therefore concludes that a medicine supposes a flowing of the humors or liquids, that it operates mechanically, that it acts only immediately, that its good or bad effects depend entirely on the bulk, motion, and figure of the acting particles, and that the destruction of the balance must be deduced from the solids. So that, as it has been found that the solids are wasted and impaired by the constant use of India tea, the chief cause of disease in general may be attributed to such a pernicious custom. Even the properties which he ascribes to medicines are in direct opposition to what have been found to be the prevailing effects of teas imported into Europe. It is consequently evident that the drinking of this injurious tea being not only in its operation productive of disease in its general sense, but also repugnant to the salutary operation of medicine, it is the most dangerous beverage that can be generally taken. For it appears from the above consideration that its pernicious effects are not confined to any system of disorders. It is found inimical to the first principles of health, and therefore may be justly dreaded as capable of being the source of disease indefinitely understood. Having thus stated, as an introduction to this essay on teas, the general tendency of those imported from India under the titles of Green, Sushang, and Bohia to injure the Constitution, the following pages will be particularly devoted to the consideration of the nature, preparation, and manner of using, and the effects of such foreign teas. End of section 2 Essay on Teas there is perhaps no subject on which there has been more declamation for and against its properties and effects than those of teas imported into this country by the companies trading from the different maritime nations of Europe to China and India. Nor has there been a controversy in which the health of the community has been so materially concerned that it affords so little direction of moment to those who would wish to ascertain the truth of such teas being either beneficial, injurious, or innocent in their effects. Amidst the mass of declamatory assertions so little intelligence is to be gained that those who have had the greatest interest in being informed of the real qualities of teas have most abandoned the inquiry before they obtain the least knowledge of what they sought. Either perplexed with abstruse science or dissatisfied with assertion equally unfounded and unsupported, thousands have discontinued the research and committed themselves to fatal experience. Thus have too many acquired a knowledge of the detrimental qualities of teas by the ruin of their constitution. To avoid, therefore, such an inconvenience, the greatest care will be taken to prevent an indiscriminate reference to authors, whose sentiments can neither sanction adduced arguments or illustrate technical allusions. The inquiry will be made with some reference to science, but more to convince by demonstration than to confound by abstruse perplexities, so that while empty declamation is avoided, the principles of truth are meant to be investigated by reason and experience. With this view, the nature of green, souchong, and bohia teas is first considered. To judge of the nature of these herbs with equal candor and propriety, it may be necessary to consider their qualities in relation to what are ascribed them, and what have been discovered by their analysis, and what have resulted from experience. The virtues that have been ascribed to them are chiefly, being a grateful diluent in health, and salutary in sickness, by attenuating viscid juices, promoting natural excretions, exciting appetite, and proving particularly serviceable in fevers, immoderate sleepiness, and headaches after a debauch. It is also added to the list of their ascribed virtues that there is no plant yet known, the infusions of which pass more freely from the body, or more speedily excite the spirits. To a person of any physical knowledge, these qualities will either appear contradictory in themselves, or rather ultimately injurious, than absolutely beneficial. As the full examination of these assumed qualities by the rules of science will require a volume, instead of a few pages which the limits of this essay will afford, the inquiry must be made as perspicuous as the necessity of brevity will admit. Allowing they are diluting in health, their constant use may so attenuate the liquids as to destroy their natural force and tensity. But Boerhaave says, There is no proper diluent but water. It is therefore evident it is the water, and not the tea, which is the diluting medium. With respect to its being an attenuative of viscid humors, it can never possess this virtue from being a diluent, 
for an attenuant acts specially on the particles by diminishing their bulk while the diluent acts upon the whole mass of the fluid the general body of the liquid may be diluted while the viscid humors remain unresolved indeed the operation of an attenuant is not easily known for many are surprised that a slight inflammation should be so difficult to dissipate, but their surprise would cease were they to consider that medicines act more generally upon the whole body than abstractly upon the part affected. Suppose to attenuate some coagulated blood, six grains of volatile salt were given, how small a proportion must come to the part diseased, when these grains, by the laws of circulation, will mix with the entire mass of blood, consisting at least of thirty pounds. Teas being said to promote natural excretions can be no recommendation of what is generally used, for this constant effect must render them too copious, and thus according to all physical experience, the blood must be thickened in the greater vessels, which frequently terminates in an atrophy. The appetite being excited by the drinking of tea is more a proof of its attrition of the solids than any stimulus to a wholesome desire of food. This quality accounts for many of the acrimonious effects too many have experienced by its use. Many have not only had their blood impoverished, but corrupted by the constant drinking of these teas. Whether it arises from any positive acrimonious salt it naturally possesses, or from any acquired corrosiveness from its mode of drying, it is not here necessary to inquire. It is only requisite to state that a pernicious effect is too fatally experienced by those who are unfortunately its slaves. How India tea can be serviceable in fevers is not easy to be understood, for if it has that effect upon the nerves to excite watchfulness, it must greatly tend to increase instead of diminish feverish symptoms. Dr. Buchan attributes even one cause of the palsy to drinking much tea or coffee, etc., and, in a note, he subjoins, quote, Many people imagine that the tea has no tendency to hurt the nerves, and that drinking the same quantity of warm water would be equally pernicious. This, however, seems to be a mistake, many persons drinking three or four cups of warm milk and water daily, without feeling any bad consequences. Yet the same quantity of tea will make their hands shake for twenty-four hours. That tea affects the nerves is likewise evident from its preventing sleep, occasioning giddiness, dimness of the sight, sickness, etc. End quote. With regard to India teas possessing the quality of exciting the spirits, this, like every other stimulus, either by constant use loses its effect, or unnerves the system it is meant to strengthen. The nerves through which the animal's spirits circulate, being like the strings of a violin or harpsichord, too frequently braced, lose, at last, their natural tensity, and thus render the human frame one system of debility. Having thus, as briefly as possible, stated that even their ascribed virtues are either derogatory to all physical principle, or else destructive to the constitution from their constant use, the nature of India teas is next considered with respect to what appears to be their chief component parts from analyzation. Teas have been found to consist principally of narcotic salts, some astringent oil, and earth. These being found in greater quantities in bohea than in green teas, those who have very sensible and elastic nerves must be seized with a greater tremor after drinking the former than the latter. The continual and irregular influx of the nervous juices is stopped by their component fibers being contracted from the roughness and restringency of such decoctions. The force of the heat or the brain's propulsion of its nervous juice being inferior to the resistance of the whole ramified fibers, thus increased by the sudden contraction of unequal motion, the flow of the animal spirits must be greatly impeded and disordered. In fact, the influx suffers a suspension, until the fibers, by relaxing again, admit their empty tubes to receive their appropriated liquids. Thus even green tea must, especially if taken strong and often, stop the natural circulation of humors and produce the attendant defects of depression of spirits, deficiency of secretion, loss of appetite, decrease of strength, waste of body, and finally, a total want of effective vigor in all the animal functions. But, as above observed, bohea tea possessing in greater quantity the pernicious ingredients, the vessels are thrown into momentary spasms and convulsive vibrations by the relaxing power of their narcotic salts, and the contracting force of the astringent oil and earth. And here it must be noticed, that oil mixed with salt is rendered astringent, thus all vegetables where a mixture of both prevails are reckoned stimulating. The narcotic power of the salt is derived from its hindering the flux of the animal spirits through the nerves.
The stomach and bowels being weakened by the above causes, windy complaints or flatulencies are consequently produced. This caused Dr. White, in his advice to patients afflicted with such diseases, to desire they would abstain from India tea as one of the flatulent aliments chiefly to be avoided. If the slightest external motion alone produces the following changes in the body, what effects may not be ascribed to the constant use of teas which we find, as before stated, operate internally? A person in perfect health, having his nostrils only touched with a feather, cannot avoid his body being so convulsed as to produce what is commonly called sneezing. But if the number of muscles agitated, the force and straining of the body by sneezing are considered, the slightness of the cause must excite no little astonishment, for this action is occasioned by the muscles of the scapula, abdomen, diaphragm, thorax, lungs, etc., and if the sneezing continues, an universal explosion of the liquids ensues. Tears, mucus, saliva, and urine are excreted. Thus, without any moist, cold, hot, dry, sulfur, salt, or any other internal or external application, an involuntary motion of all the solids and fluids is produced by a feather touching, in the slightest manner, the inside of our nostrils. But Boerhaave relates further, quote, that if sneezing continues a long time, as it will by taking one hundredth part of a grain of euphorbium up the nose, grievous and continued convulsions will arise, headaches, involuntary excretions of urine, etc., vomitings, febrile heats, and other dreadful symptoms, and at last death itself will ensue, end quote. It is therefore evident that the slightest bodies produce the greatest changes in the human frame. Such is the power of certain particles upon the nerves that the stomach will be thrown into convulsions that almost threaten an inversion by taking only four ounces of a wine in which so small a portion of glass of antimony as one scruple is infused in eight pounds of the former. And what is still more remarkable is that the glass of antimony remains not only undissolved but, comparatively speaking, undiminished in its weight. These being a few of the fatal afflictions which experience shows to be frequently the consequence of drinking India teas, its injurious nature is too evident to require any further investigation of either their ascribed or positive qualities. The next subject to be considered relative to India teas is their preparation. Among the different authors of any consequence that have written on the culture, preparation, and virtues of foreign teas may be ranked Camphor, Postlethwaite, Dr. Cunningham, Priestley, Lemery, Francus, Meister, and Siegsbeck. As the limits of this treatise will not permit a detail of observations from the whole of these writers, remarks can only be selected from the most principal of them. Most of the above and many other authors agree that the leaves are spread upon iron plates and thus dried with several little furnaces contained in one room. This mode of preparation must greatly tend to deprive the shrub of its native juices, and to contract a rust from the iron on which it is dried. This may probably be the cause of vitriol turning tea into an inky blackness. We therefore do not think, with Boerhaave, that the preparers employ green vitriol for improving the color of the finer green teas. It may, however, be concluded, from the color of bohea, souchong, and such as are called black teas, that they may be thus tinctured by the means of vitriol after they have been dried upon the iron plates in the furnace room. And this may likewise particularly cause that astringent quality which is more experienced in all the black than any of the green teas. According to Siegsbeck, the colors of these teas are artificial so that if these pernicious arts are used even to give the tea a particular color, there is no difficulty in ascribing the cause of their injurious effects. That the native virtues of these teas are liable to considerable perversion is evident from the manner in which Meister relates they are prepared. He says the leaves are put into a hot kettle just emptied of boiling water, and that they are kept in this closely covered until they are cold, when they are strewed upon the hot plates above mentioned for drying. It is easy to conceive how the virtues of a leaf, however salutary by nature, must be destroyed by such a process. Being thus put into a steaming kettle and suffered to remain there until they are cold, must cause the greatest part of their virtues to evaporate, and the leaves to imbibe an unwholesome taint from the effluvia of the steaming metal. It cannot therefore be ascertained whether teas that are imported in Europe, after such a mutating preparation, have the least remains of their original odor or flavor, no more than they have of their qualities. 
but on the contrary it seems impossible but that the original nature of this shrub is entirely destroyed by an artificial preparation some falsely suppose that this species of management is only to soften such of those leaves as are grown too dry and are therefore liable to break in the curling but this will evidently appear not the cause when it is considered that the greater part of the teas must dry in such a hot climate while they are gathering and as they are particularly anxious to send them in as curious a curled state as possible, such teas must thus be moistened again, in order to curl them afterwards in that perfect manner which is performed on the iron plates of the furnace. The opinion, therefore, of teas deriving their green color from being dried upon copper being founded on a misrepresentation of the manner in which they are really prepared, a few observations upon the subject are indispensably necessary. For those who have always understood that the detrimental qualities of foreign teas were the consequence of their being dried upon copper, may perhaps imagine they cannot be so pernicious if they were dried upon iron. But this opinion cannot be entertained by any persons who have the least knowledge of the manner in which the vegetable acid will corrode iron. Those who are acquainted with the culinary processes must know in what manner the acid of onions will operate upon any steel instrument. It corrodes a knife so as to turn the onions black with the particles eaten away from the edge and the face of the blade. To avoid this unwholesome and unseemly inconvenience, a wooden instrument is generally used in all the instances where onions form a part of the cookery appendages. It is consequently evident that although iron utensils are now greatly used instead of copper, yet many injurious effects may happen from their being liable to be corroded by the acid of several vegetables. And if the nitrous acid of the air will corrode iron so as to cause rust, when it will not produce the same proportionate effect upon copper, it is a demonstration that iron is the most liable to such a corruption. The corrosions of copper are undoubtedly pernicious, but the damage that tea would derive from its being dried upon the sheets of this metal would not operate so injuriously to those who drink it as it does now by lying dried upon iron. For the latter bring more liable to the power of the mineral, vegetable, or animal acid, must impart more particles of its reduced calyx to the tea than copper would. And, in order to show how susceptible of corrosion iron is, the following instance is farther adduced. In Ireland, where some persons practice the art of tanning leather with fern, which possesses a very strong acid, particular care is taken to avoid using any iron vessels in the tannage, lest the color of the leather should be blackened by the corroding particle of the metal. As it is the peculiar property of iron or steely particles, even in their most perfect state, to operate as too great an astringent for an aliment that is taken twice a day constantly, tea, when dried upon it, must be rendered proportionably pernicious. But admitting that the popular opinion of their being dried upon copper was just, the teas must be rendered proportionably injurious to the quantity of copperas or crude vitriol they imbibe from their acidity corroding the metal. Preparations of steel that are in many instances considered as most salutary, yet in all pulmonary disorders the most eminent physicians have deemed them exceedingly dangerous. And in a country like Great Britain, Holland, and other places where a cloudy atmosphere caused from their marshy soil or watery situations renders most of the inhabitants subject to complaints of the lungs, foreign teas contaminated by these iron corrosions must be particularly detrimental. It is therefore from these considerations evident that foreign teas, by being dried upon iron, have their bad qualities so increased as to render them the most pernicious of any morning and evening liquid that has yet to be taken. To return from whence we began this short digression, it is remarkable that no satisfactory account has yet been given in what the bohea differs from the green tea. Dr. Cunningham, physician to the English settlement at Simpson, and Camphor assert that the bohea is the leaves of the first collection. This, however, being contrary to the general report of all travelers, that none of the first produce is brought to Europe, must be discredited, for these are all preserved for the princes, to whom they are sold, even in China, at an immense price. Another proof is that the bohias are brought here in their most considerable quantities, at a price greatly inferior to what even the second, third, and fourth crops are sold for in China. This not only evinces how inferior in quality the black tea must be, but also how little they are valued among those who must be acquainted with their properties. Although the European dealers divide the green teas chiefly into three sorts and the bohias into five, yet it is unknown from what province they are brought, of what crop they are the produce, and to which of the Chinese sorts they belong. Added to their abusive preparation may be that of their package, 
it is impossible but to know that their bad qualities must be considerably augmented by being so closely packed for such a length of time in such slight wooden chests lined with a composition of wood and lead considerable quantities are likewise damaged by salt water and other causes which by the management of the tea dealers are mostly mixed and sold under different denominations how the tea must be affected by the corrosion of the lead and tin by the marine acid those of the least chemical knowledge will easily determine to what danger must therefore the constitution of those who are in the constant habit of drinking such an empoisoned drug be exposed may easily be imagined surely when all these circumstances are considered respecting the pernicious mode of preparation and particularly the poisonous qualities they are also liable to contract from the nature of their package every person must be convinced to what a loss of health if not of life the constant use of such teas must expose them such evidence of their deleterious tendency is most sufficient to alarm mankind against so prevailing an evil without any further arguments but as health is too precious not to require every possible proof that can persuade us to avoid what so immediately threatens our existence the following arguments and testimonies of the bad qualities of foreign teas must not be omitted previous however to any investigation of their effect it may be necessary to say a few words respecting the manner of using End of section 3 The Manner of Using Foreign tea, as before observed, being taken as two principal meals of our daily aliment, is undoubtedly one great reason of the constitution of the people having suffered an entire change in its system. That vigor, spirits, and longevity which characterized us in the last century is totally subverted. Disease, dismay, and debility now lead us prematurely to the grave, where we end an existence too deplorable to excite the least desire for a longer continuance. Dr. Priestley states, very justly in his medical essays, that it is curious to observe the revolution which hath taken place within this century in the constitutions of the inhabitants of Europe inflammatory diseases more rarely occur and in general are much less rapid and violent in their progress than formerly nor do they admit of the same antiphlogistic method of cure which was practiced with success a hundred years ago the experienced sydenham makes forty ounces of blood the mean quantity to be drawn in the acute rheumatism whereas this disease as it now appears in the london hospitals will not bear above half that evacuation vernal intermittents are frequently cured by a vomit and the bark without venous section which is a proof that at present they are accompanied with fewer symptoms of inflammation than they were wont to be this advantageous change however is more than counterbalanced by the introduction of a numerous class of nervous aliments in a greater measure unknown to our ancestors but which now prevail universally and are complicated with almost every other distemper the bodies of men are enfeebled and enervated and it is not uncommon to observe very high degrees of irritability under the external appearance of great strength and robustness the hypochondriac palsies cachexies dropsies and all those diseases which arise from laxity and debility are in our days endemic everywhere and the hysterics which used to be peculiar to women as the name itself indicates now attacks both sexes indiscriminately it is evident that so great a revolution could not be effected without the concurrence of many causes but amongst these i apprehend the present general use of tea holds the first and principal rank the second cause may perhaps be allotted to excess in spirituous liquors this pernicious custom owes its rise to the former which by the lowness and depression of spirits it occasions renders it almost necessary to have recourse to what is cordial and exhilarating and hence proceeds those odious and disgraceful habits of intemperance with which too many of the softer sects of every degree are now alas chargeable these are the sentiments of a character distinguished for his elaborate researches and judicious discoveries in almost every branch of liberal science it may therefore be safely concluded that the general manner of using india tea morning and evening has been and is the principal cause of the greater part of the diseases with which the natives of europe are now afflicted when it is considered that the first meal which is taken to recruit the body after the loss it sustains from insensible perspiration of the preceding night and to prepare it for the avocations of the succeeding day is india tea who can be surprised that nature should rapidly become the victim of disease thus instead of being supported by nutritious aliment its nerves are enfeebled its spirits diminished and all its functions enveloped with the gloom of melancholy 
Even in the afternoon, when nature is exhausted by care and fatigue, we fly for refreshment to tea, which instead of bracing still further relaxes the unnerved system. Such are the evil effects of the imprudent manner in which this pernicious drug is so constantly and universally used. But how must these evils appear in their extent when the following view is taken of India teas, with regard to their various injurious effects? In all the physical experiments that have been made upon India teas, there is perhaps none that shows its acid astringency more than one tried by the above writer, Dr. Priestley. Endeavoring to trace the differences and ascertain the astringency and bitterness of vegetables reciprocally bear to each other, he imagined he had found they were distinct and separate properties by the following experiment. Taking two pieces of calf skin just stripped from the calf, he emerged them into cold infusions of green and bohea tea. At the expiration of a week, he found they were hard and curled up, and that there was no sensible difference between them. He therefore concluded that this experiment afforded a striking proof of India tea differently affecting a dead and living fiber. Thus he considered as the greatest effect of a medicine. But, with deference to so distinguished an author, I cannot but attribute this astringency of the skin to the particular properties of India tea. For all physical as well as medical experience proves that vegetable produce affords some that are astringent and others that are relaxant of the dead as well as the living fiber. Oak bark is equally astringent and hardens the fibers of the hide as well as it braces the living nerve of our bodies. Therefore, the effect produced by the India tea upon the dead skin only proves what we have before related, that an infusion of it has a peculiar effect which, being too frequently applied to the nerves, destroys their tensity by their fine fibers being either broken or relaxed by overbracing. Were any astringency to be constantly taken, it must ultimately produce more or less such an effect, so that while the above experiment of the learned philosopher demonstrates that India tea has the power of astringing the dead as well as the living fibers, it does not prove that astringency bitterness are separate qualities. On the contrary, bitterness seems to be the characteristic taste of all that has the tendency to contract whatever is the subject of its application. Thus, galls, bark, rhubarb, chamomile tea, etc., etc., are all bitter and astringent. It is, therefore, the immoderate use of such an astringent that ultimately relaxes and debilitates. Like the too frequent bracing of a drum, or any other stringed musical instrument destroys its tensity, the body is unnerved by the overstretching of its fibers. Although we sometimes differ with the celebrated doctor in part of the conclusion he has drawn from his experiment, yet the following sentiments so perfectly coincide with all our observations upon the deities that we are happy to have the opportunity of corroborating our own with the sentiments of so eminent a philosopher. He says from his experiments, quote, It appears that green and bohea teas are equally bitter, strike precisely the same black tinge with green vitriol, and are alike astringent on the simple fiber. From this exact similarity, in so many circumstances, one should be led to suppose that there would be no sensible diversity in their operation on the living body. But the fact is otherwise. Green tea is much more sedative and relaxant than bohea. And the finer the species of tea, the more debilitating and pernicious are its effects, as I have frequently observed in others, and experienced in myself. This seems to be a proof that the mischiefs ascribed to this oriental vegetable do not arise from the warm vehicle by which it is conveyed into the stomach, but chiefly from its own peculiar qualities." Unquote. Dr. Hugh Smith, in his treatise on the action of the muscles, justly says that an infusion of India tea not only diminishes but destroys the bodily functions. Thea infusum, nervo musculo verane ad multum, viras multices minuit perdit. Newman, in his chemistry, says that when fresh gathered, teas are said to be narcotic and to disorder the senses. The Chinese, therefore, cautiously abstain from their use until they have been kept twelve months. The reason attributed for bohea tea being less injurious than green is, being more hastily dried, the pernicious qualities more copiously evaporate. Tea, says Dr. Hugh Smith in his dissertation upon the nerves, quote, is very hurtful both to the stomach and nerves. Frenzies, deliriums, vigilation, idiotism, apoplexies, and other disorders of the brain are all produced by the nerves being thus disarranged and debilitated. If the digestive faculty of the stomach be weakened, the body, failing of recruiting juices, must tend to emaciation, and the whole frame be rendered one system of distress and infirmity. 
The nerves, being thus deprived of a sufficiency of their animal spirits, must become languid, and leave every sense void of the first means of conveying to the mind the only enjoyments of our temporal existence. But if there be any class of persons to whom India tea is more peculiarly hurtful than to any other, it is that which includes the studious and sedentary, and especially those who are enfeebled with gout, stone, and rheumatism. Age, accident, or avocation cause many persons to be unfortunately ranked amongst those of the latter description. These, from their intensity of thought, want of exercise, injurious position of body, respiration of unwholesome air, and variety of other causes, have not only their animal spirits exhausted, but their liquids corrupted from the loss of necessary circulation. With these evils, India tea operates as an absolute poison. Indeed, it frequently renders those incurable who might by other means have been relieved. When a view is taken of the dismal effects produced by India teas, the mind seems to be bewildered in searching for the cause of using so generally a drug that is so universally destructive. It chiefly originated in a fundamental mistake of physical principles. About the time that India tea was introduced to Europe, a grievous error crept into the practice of medical professors. They falsely imagined that health could not be more promoted than by increasing the fluidity of the blood. This opinion once established, it is no wonder that mankind with one accord adopted the infusion of India tea which was then a novelty to Europe, as the best means of obtaining the above effect. By the advice of Bentico, chiefly was the pernicious custom of drinking warm liquors night and day established. To this man, and the introduction of India tea, may be ascribed that revolution in the health of Europeans which has happened since the last century. The present age, therefore, have great cause to lament, in what they suffer in nervous complaints, that their forefathers did not attend more to the scientific and judicious advice of the illustrious Duncan, Boerhaave, and the whole school of Leiden, who prescribed this error. Although they could not entirely prevent this physical abuse, yet their zealous endeavors did, in some degree, at first impede its progress. But, however, so powerful did novelty plead in favor of India teas, that at last general custom and prejudice bore away every barrier that had been erected by these learned and experienced physicians. This error, instead of diminishing, has increased. Most valetudinarians are now of opinion that a thick blood is the sole cause of their complaints. With this impression, they adopt what they call the diluent beverage of India teas. It can scarcely be imagined how many disorders this practice produces. It may be justly termed the box of Pandora, without even hope remaining at the bottom. End quote. Tissot says, quote, There are the prolific sources of hypochondriac melancholy, which both adds strength to and is one of the worst of disorders. End quote. He adds, quote, with regard to studious men, who are naturally weak and feeble, such warm beverages are more hurtful to them than to others. For they are not troubled with an over-thick, but on the contrary too thin a blood. You are all aware, continues he, respectable auditors, that the density of the blood is as the motion of the solids, the fibers of the learned are relaxed, their motions are slow, and their blood, of consequence, thin. Bleed a plowman and a doctor at the same time. From the first there will be a flow of thick blood, resembling inflammatory blood, almost solid and of a deep red. The blood of the latter will be either of a faint red, or without any color, soft, gelatinous, and will almost entirely turn them to water. Your blood, therefore, men of learning, should not be dissolved, but brought to a consistence, and you should in general be moderate in the article of drinking, and cautiously avoid warm spiritous liquors. Amongst the favorite beverages of the learned, the same Tissot observes, is the infusion of that famous leaf, so well known by the name of India tea, which, to our great detriment, has every year, for these two centuries past, been constantly imported from China and Japan. This most pernicious gift first destroys the strength of the stomach, and if it be not soon laid aside, equally destroys that of the viscera, the blood, the nerves, and of the whole body so that malignant and all chronical disorders will appear to increase, especially nervous disorders, in proportion as the use of India tea becomes common, and you may easily form a judgment from the diseases that prevail in every country whether the inhabitants are lovers of tea or the contrary. How happy would it be for Europe if, by unanimous consent, the importation of this infamous leaf was prohibited, which is endued only with a corrosive force derived from the acrimony of a gum with which it is pregnant. 
End quote. Having thus considered the dismal and too frequently fatal consequences of the nerves being affected, it is presumed this part of the essay cannot be more interestingly concluded than by a summary of the distinct symptomatic effects attending, more or less, complaints of the nerves. And although the following symptoms are alarming with regard to their number and variety, yet the reader may be assured there is not one specified but what is either the immediate or ultimate effect of a nervous affection, and which is too frequently the consequence of the violent astringency of foreign tea taken injudiciously as a constant aliment. A faintness, succeeding with a delusive vision of motes, mists, and clouds, falling backwards and forwards before the distempered sight. A yawning, gaping, stretching out of the arms, twitching of the nerves, sneezing, drowsiness, and contraction of the breast. Dullness, debility, distress, and dismay, with a great sense of weariness. A wan complexion, a languid eye, a loathing stomach, and an uncertain appetite, which, if not immediately satisfied, is irremediably lost. Heart burning, bilious vomitings, belchings, pains in the pit of the stomach, and shortness of breath. Dizziness, inveterate pains in the temples and other parts of the head, a tingling noise in the ear, a throbbing of the brain, especially of the temporal arteries, symptoms of asthma, tickling coughs, visible inflations and unusual scents affecting the olfactory nerves, sometimes costive and sometimes relaxed, sudden flushings of heat and suffusions of countenance, in the night alternate sweats and shiverings, especially down the back, which seems to feel as if water was poured down that part of the body. A tialism, or discharge of phlegm from the glands of the throat, which generally attends all the symptoms. Troublesome pains between the shoulders, pains attended with hot sensations, cramps, and convulsive motions of the muscles, or a few of their fibers. Sudden startings of the tendons of the legs and arms. Copious and frequent discharges of pale and limpid urine. Vertigos, long faintings, and cold, moist, clammy sweat about the temples and forehead. Wandering pains in the sides, back, knees, ankles, arms, wrists, and somewhat resembling rheumatic pains. The head generally warm while the rest of the body is cold or chilly. Obstinate watchings, disturbed sleep, frightful dreams, the nightmare, startings when awake, and the mind filled with the most terrific apprehensions. Tremors of the limbs and palpitations of the heart. A very variable and irregular pulse. Periodical pains in the head. A sense of suffocation, frequent sighings, and shedding of tears. Convulsive spasms of the muscles, tendons, nerves of the back, loins, arms, hands, and a general convulsion of the stomach, bowels, throat, legs, and indeed almost every other part of the body. A quick apprehension forgetful, unsettled, and constant to nothing but inconstancy. A wandering and delirious imagination, groundless fears, and an exquisite sense of his sufferings. A gradually sinking into a nervous atrophy or consumption. A perpetual alarm of approaching death. Sometimes cheerful and sometimes melancholy. Without present enjoyment or future expectation of anything but increasing misery and debility. If these symptoms are inconsiderately suffered to continue, they soon terminate in palsy, hip, madness, epilepsy, apoplexy, or in some mortal disease, as the black jaundice, dropsy, consumption, etc. Having ascertained from this inquiry the injurious properties of India tea, it may naturally be expected that I should propose some article that might prove more beneficial. With this requisition I shall most readily comply, although I may expose myself to the invidious censure of having directed all my efforts to establish the celebrity of whatever article I may recommend. But being convinced that by publishing the virtue of a tea that I have investigated from physical analysis and particular observation, I may essentially serve the public, I am content to suffer the obloquy, provided it is productive of a general benefit. Having, as before observed, examined with the greatest attention the nature of most articles that have been offered as morning and afternoon beverage, there are two which claim most particularly the preference of all others that are sold under the denomination of tea. These are, first, that which was discovered by the eminent botanist Sir Hans Sloane, and the other by a botanist and physician equally celebrated, Dr. Solander. 
I therefore, without considering in what manner the interest of the proprietors of these tea may be individually affected, propose two articles, in order to show that my partiality or opinion of the virtues of the one could not prejudice me so far as to prevent my allowing due praise to any other possessing qualities deserving approbation. I am happy to state that, from my analysis of that invented by Sir Hans Sloane, called British tea, I found it possesses most singular virtues for relieving many nervous complaints. But, from the same trials and experiments made on that invented by Dr. Solander, I have been convinced that, although the qualities of the former are exceedingly salutary, they are not so general in their restoration and nutritious effects as the latter. Being thus convinced of the extraordinary properties of Dr. Solander's tea, I have been induced to state, in a treatise upon their nature, preparation, and effects, reasons founded on chemical analysis, physical efficiency, and experimental observation, in support of their most eminent virtues. After every trial I have made of coffee, chocolate, and most other preparations that have been and are at present offered to the public as a substitute for tea, none seem to claim the preference so eminently as that invented by Dr. Solander. From their analysis, I find their virtues are of the most corrective and balsamic kind. They strengthen the tone of the stomach, not by astringing the solids, but by lubricating the vessels, sheathing the acrids, and attenuating the liquids. In this manner they restore the equilibrium of the oscillatory motions, which establish the tone of the nervous system. This being strengthened, the animal spirits are enabled to dispense their reviving influence to the sensitive, digestive, and intellectual powers. And these being thus restored to their vigor of operation, a simple and moderate portion of food is rendered the most nutritious, and the body is consequently established in the enjoyment of health and happiness. The above virtues of the sanative tea are not here asserted as a declamatory panegyric, but as the result of a physical analysis of their nature, and serious examination into their mode of operating as a restorative and constant aliment. Without presuming their qualities to be an unlimited remedy for all complaints, the nature of the preparation of this tea is compared with the causes and effects of nervous disorders. From this comparison, their relative virtue to such diseases are most clearly evinced, and thus is this invaluable discovery proved to be the most effectual remedy for all those complaints caused by drinking foreign teas that was ever yet or may be hereafter invented. In proposing to the public any simple or compound for the preserving, increasing, or restoring health, the first object should be to explain its nature. This is the principal test by which its merits can be known, or mankind rationally induced to try its virtues. And as this sanative tea is offered as a substitute for what is generally used as two-fourths of our aliment, and which, from the preceding inquiry, has been found the principal cause of our present infirmities, the greater necessity there is for a candid investigation of its nature. Impressed with the above conviction, it is fairly stated that the nature of this sanative tea is not from any combination of the animal or mineral kingdom, but a collection of the most salutary native and exotic herbs that are produced in the vegetable empire of nature. These have not been collected by the fanatic devotees of occult qualities, but by the scientific researches and personal experience of a character that is equally and justly admired for his philosophical, medical, and botanical knowledge. The discoverer, Dr. Solander, of this tea, inquired into the virtues of each native and exotic herb of which it is composed, not only by abstract reasoning upon its relative qualities, but by the more immediate evidence of his senses. By submitting each vegetable to his taste and smell, he derived the most certain physical proof of its qualities. Thus he knew the particular virtues of each, and what salutary effects they must, from their preparation as a compound, produce when applied as a relief for the innumerable diseases caused by drinking foreign teas. Not confining himself to English plants, he studied and examined the virtues of exotics, among which he discovered some that possess virtues he had not found in those in his own country. By adopting these, he has increased the salutary effects of his invaluable tea. From reading Hippocrates, Discorides, and Galen, he found the ancients derived all their knowledge of plants by their taste and smell. With these examples before him, and his own propensity to study, joined to his penetrating judgment, it is no wonder he should have so well succeeded. Thus he recurred to the original mode of inquiry, which first established and raised the eminence of physic, neglecting that delusive principle of Aristotle's philosophy, which has since taught too many physicians to express the virtue of medicines by hot, cold, 
moist and dry, without deriving the least information from their senses, Dr. Solander, aided by chemical analysis, distinguished the virtue by the taste or odor of every plant. By this means, their specific juices he found tasted either earthy, mucilaginous, sweet, bitter, aromatic, fetid, acrid, or corrosive. From this experience, he found the observation of some botanists to be true, quote, that there is no virtue yet known in plants but what depends on the taste or smell, and may be known by them, unquote. With this infallible means of pursuing his inquiry, he formed a tea composed of herbs that are in their nature astringent, balsamic, aromatic, syphilic, and diaphoretic. These virtues combined may be said to form one of the most incomparable specifics as a nutritive and restoring aliment that has been discovered. In the astringent, the acid fixing upon the more earthly parts, the nutritious oil is more easily separated, which renders them also pectoral, cleaning, and diuretic. This part of the tea is in its nature particularly serviceable in all cases where vulnerary medicines are requisite. They particularly amend the acid in the nervous juice, and thus restore the equal motion of the spirits, which were obstructed or retarded by spasms or convulsions. By the volatile oil and volatile pungent salt, obstructions are opened, and the motions of the languid blood increase to a healthy degree of circulation. They resolve coagulated phlegm in the stomach, preserve the fluidity of the juices, and promote digestion by assisting the bile in its operation. And with regard to their balsamic and aromatic nature, these qualities warm the stomach and expel wind by rarefying the flatuous exhalations from chyle in the prima viae. These, by their sweetness, allay the sharpness of rheums and linify their acrimony. Being filled with an oily salt, they open the passage of the lungs and kidneys. By opening the pores, they extraordinarily discuss outward tumors and attenuate the internal coagulation. All these virtues may be said to be derived from the union of their balsamic oil and volatile salt. By a second class of aromatics, with which Dr. Solander composed this sanative tea, is such as have a bitter astringency joined to their volatile oil and salt. These united qualities correct acids in the stomach, cleanse the lungs, and open obstructions in the glands caused by coagulated serum, and the saline pungent oil altering the acids in the glands of the brain by correcting and attenuating its lympha and succus nervosus produces the same effect. For the lympha and nervous juices are, like other glandulous humors, liable to acidity and stagnation. Therefore these aromatics, by exciting their motion and correcting their acidities, render the liquids of the nerves more volatile, and are therefore justly termed cephalics. And as it is the property of volatiles to ascend, the reason is evident of the brain being assisted by their salutary qualities. These aromatics likewise evacuate serum from the blood, promote its circulation, and attenuate the coagulations of chyle, lympha, and succus nervosus. And here it is proper to add that all aromatics, by rarefying the blood, are cordial. There being aromatic astringents in this tea, its infusion strengthens the fibers and membranes of the stomach, and all the nervous system, in such a manner as not to destroy their tensity by that too great contraction caused by the foreign teas, and having no acids in their astringency, the blood is preserved from too great a rarefaction, which would otherwise happen from the pungency of their oily qualities. These also excite the appetite, by stimulating the natural progress of the chyle, and thus prevent its too rapid fermentation of its spiritous parts into windy flatuencies. For the same reason, vinegar is taken with hot meats and herbs. Having mentioned vinegar, it may not be improper to state this vegetable acid is the best antidote against the poison of any acrid herbs. That part of the tea which has a mucilaginous taste is inwardly cooler than oil, although it be different in nature. Such herbs defend the throat from the sharpness of rheums, the stomach from corrosive humors of disease or acrimonious medicines, the ureters from sharp choleric or acid urine, and lubricate the passage for the stony gravel. Their crude parts cool the heat of scorbutic blood, lessen its violent motion, and sheathe its acrid saline particles. By their different mucilaginous principles they produce the following various salutary effects. The earthy repel the cool outward inflammations. The watery, which is thick and gummous, stop fluxes and correct sharp humors. Those of an oily odor alleviate pains. Those of a pungent acrid dissolve tartarous concretions in the kidneys. 
From these and a variety of other salutary properties, it is evident the general nature of Dr. Solander's tea is such as to correct acrid humors, promote the secretions, restore the equilibrium between the fluids and solids, and finally to brace every part of the relaxed nervous system. The body being thus relieved from obstructions, its circulations restored, the digestive faculties invigorated, and the spirits reanimated, the debilitated constitution is reinstated in all its enjoyments of health and hilarity. It may be therefore observed that the principle of this tea is to nourish as a general aliment, while it renovates the human constitution, without having recourse to the nauseous portions of galenical preparation, or the hazardous trial of calibiate waters. As this tea is particularly salutary in all cases where mineral waters are generally recommended, it is very proper the public should be cautioned against the danger which too frequently attends the constant drinking of them. Calibiate waters, it must be acknowledged, have effected very extraordinary cures in certain cases, but when so great an author as Helmont says that such waters are fatal to all those who are afflicted with paraneumonic complaints, it is surely necessary they should be resorted to with the greatest caution, and even in complaints where they may be serviceable, it is necessary to observe whether they really possess those calibiate qualities for which they are commended. Those who have written upon their virtues assert, and with seeming propriety, that where they deposit an ochreous sediment, they are certainly dispossessed of their steely virtues. For ochre, being no other than the calx of iron, such a residue evinces the evaporation of the more eminent properties of the calibiate, by the phlogiston of the mineral escaping by its extreme volatility. Every metal deprived of this igneous principle is immediately reduced to a calx, and thus deprived of its splendor, fusibility, and other properties until restored again by the readmission of its phlogiston. Calcined lead, having lost this inflammable quality, is reduced to a red calx or mineral earth, which, if fluxed with an igneous body, such as oil, pitch, wax, fat, wood, bone, or mineral oil or bitumen, the fiery principle is resorbed, and the lead restored to its essential qualities. From these physical observations, the reader may be convinced of those mineral waters as afford such a sediment being in a state of decomposition. They are thus deprived of one of the four elements or principles of which they are all more or less composed. Every analysis of mineral waters in their perfect state has demonstrated that they possess a fixed air, a volatile alkali, a volatile vitriolic acid, and the phlogiston. If, therefore, either of these essential qualities is evaporated or corrupted, the water being in a state of decomposition must lose the virtues of a medicinal calibiate. It is only necessary to add a few further remarks in order to show in what particular complaints calibiates, even in their most perfect state, are pernicious. By this means, many of the diseased will be guarded against a fatal error, and as the prejudices in favor of such applications is so universally prevalent, it is hoped a few pages allotted to this subject will be deemed a most essential service to a deluded community. By removing such a pernicious partiality, the health, if not the lives of thousands, may be saved, to the great enjoyment of themselves and their relatives. Dr. Knight says very justly, quote, that the explication of the manner of the operation of calibiate medicines in human bodies is grounded upon false principles and not matters of fact, to wit, that all calibiate preparations in a liquid form owe their medicinal efficacy to the metal dissolved, whether in an aqueous or spiritus menstruum, retaining its metallic texture." Unquote. To avoid entering into the whole detail of this interesting argument, it is only here stated in support of the above assertion that as mineral waters are impregnated with a combination of sulfurs, salts, and earth, their virtues cannot be properly ascribed as they have been to the metals which they contain. It might be further proved that iron cannot possibly enter the blood, retaining its essential qualities, for metals in general except mercury are suspended in liquids in salutis principius, or principles disengaged, which are thus deprived of their metallic properties. Iron, entering the body as a volatile vitriolic acid, cannot act by its specific gravity as mercury does. It therefore acts per accidens, and not per se.
but admitting that waters, however impregnated with iron, are efficacious in checking all diarrhea and other profuse evacuations by closing the relaxed vessels and in crassetting the fluids, yet as they prove sometimes so astringent as to stop the natural secretions, the consequences are frequently cramps, dangerous convulsions, which often end in fevers, inflammations, and mortifications. Their indiscriminate use should be most cautiously avoided. Calibiates, thus contracting the least pervious glands, should not be taken in acute inflammations, or in any complaints that are attended with a quick and strong pulse, a plethora, or extravasation of humors. They are equally dangerous in all nervous contractions, or where the blood is got into the arteriole, or capillary vessels. Thus, instead of acting like the sanative tea which softens, smooths, and unbends the two constringed fibers, the vitriolic salts of this mineral water but more contract the fibrillae, by operating like so many wedges, which ultimately tear, rend, or divide the tender filaments. It must, however, be admitted that mineral waters are very beneficial in cachexies, scurvies, jaundice, hypochondriacal, and hysterical affections. Having paid this tribute to their virtues, it is evident that what is above stated respecting their pernicious effects has been dictated by candor, and with no illiberal disposition to deny their absolute virtues. These few remarks have been only made in order to warn the community against a prevailing and indiscriminate use which might otherwise, in many complaints, prove at least fatal to their health, if not to their existence. And as the tea discovered by Dr. Solander possesses all the virtues of the calibiate without its dangerous principles, it was an immediate duty not only to warn but direct the public in their adoption of an aliment so essential to their health and consequently temporal happiness. End of section 4 Preparation as the native and exotic herbs of this tea are dried in a pure air, without any artificial means of preparation to improve their colour or increase their natural astringency, they must be free from those deleterious, corrosive and violent contractive effects with which we have observed the general and indiscriminate use of foreign teas and mineral waters are attended. In the first part of this essay, it was stated that foreign teas were dried upon iron and thus produced those astringent effects we have seen to characterize Calebeate waters. It is therefore evident that the simple preparation of these salutary herbs, being free from what renders teas and mineral waters in many cases pernicious, must leave their qualities pure and unadulterated, according to the intent and principle of nature in their production. They are, therefore, found particularly free from those injurious properties which render green tea so destructive to emaciated constitutions. Instead of being, like the above foreign tea, hurtful to those worn down by a long fever, or such as have weak and delicate stomachs, their qualities are in such complaints essentially nutritious and restorative. That stimulating roughness, which foreign teas imbibe from their iron preparation, is not to be found in the sanative tea discovered by Dr. Solander. The latter is therefore very beneficial, where the mucous coats of the bowels is very thin, or the ramification of the nerves numerous, extensive, and exquisitely sensible of impression. The colic, gripes, or painful prickings of the nervous coat by the India teas are allayed by the drinking of the sanative tea, from its tepid and lubricating nature not being perverted by any corrosive preparation. To thin and meagre bodies, which are greatly affected by green and bohea teas, the above is a most restorative aliment. The atrophy and diabetes, so frequently caused by the foreign teas, are, from the herbs of Dr. Solander's tea possessing their natural, nutritious qualities, uncontaminated by metallic preparation, often cured by using it as a morning and evening beverage. And the depression of spirits occasioned by green and bohea, and which induces many of its drinkers to take sal volatile, or spirits of hartshorn, is avoided by the sanative tea for the latter is found one of the greatest and most salutary exhilarators of the nervous system. And thus, 
those who drink it as a constant aliment are saved from the dangers that attend rendering the blood too thin by the use of the above volatile alkalis or drams which are too frequently taken to avoid that lowness of spirits caused by the great sudden and violent contraction of the nervous fibrilli as the inconveniences of the foreign teas arise from the metallic properties derived from their preparation the advantages of the sanative tea are evidently seen to arise from the preparation being such as leaves every herb possessed of its natural and essential quality this clearly evincing the superiority of dr solander's tea to every herbal beverage it only remains to proceed to the two remaining inquiries respecting the mode of using and the effects of this salutary combination of vegetables the next subject therefore of investigation is the manner of using end of section five manner of using as the time of drinking this tea is morning and evening it is necessary to inquire whether its qualities are such as are calculated to suit the temporary necessities of nature at those periods. From what has been observed respecting foreign teas, it is evident that their properties are diametrically opposite to those which nature at such times requires. When the body is exhausted by insensible perspiration, the most requisite aliment is that which can equally restore the loss of the solids and the languid flow of the animal spirits. What is then taken ought therefore to be neither too heavy for the state of the unbraced system, nor too volatile to afford a sufficient quantity of nutritive juices to the whole animal economy. Nor should the aliment be so stimulating as to disorder instead of re-establishing the equalized motion of the yet perturbed state of the animal spirits. What is then given should have the power of sedating the nervous fluids while it disseminates through the viscera the elements of nutrition. These being the requisite properties of what is taken as a breakfast, it remains to consider whether those of the sanative tea are adequate to such indispensable purposes. In the preceding part of this inquiry, it has been found that the principal qualities of this tea are moderately astringent, balsamic, and aromatic. It is therefore evident that, from a combination of these eminent medical principles, this tea must operate as a sedator of perturbation, a renovator of exhausted solids, and an exhilarator of nervous depression. It may therefore be used as a morning beverage with the greatest advantage for the preservation and re-establishment of health for never were the qualities of any aliment so particularly adapted to the necessities of the body at any stated period as those of the sanative tea are at the time of breakfast. Without loading the exhausted viscera, they afford it a sufficiency of balsamic and nutritive aliment. Nor does the sanative tea, by sedating the fluttering spirits, destroy their vigour, but... On the contrary, by calming their motion, they contribute more active energy by promoting their equalized progress. And thus is the animal economy restored to the proper use and enjoyment of its functions. And in proportion, as the spirits are restored to an equilibrium of motion and fluidity, the relaxed tone of the nerves is recovered, and the whole functions of man rendered capable of exercise and enjoyment. The above being stated as the advantages attending the use of the sanative tea in the morning, it is next expedient to consider what benefit is derived from the use of it in the afternoon. At this time, the body is in a very different state of temperature from that of the morning. By the toil, care, study, or amusement of the former part of the day, the solids are wasted and the fluids in a state of ferment and evaporation. Added to this, the aliment which is taken at dinner time so exhausts the animal warmth 
as to leave the whole body in a state of refrigeration. What is therefore taken in this situation should be neither relaxing, constipating, nor heating. It should possess a genial warmth, a cordial assistant, and a restorative nutriment. The first should be such as to supply the deficiency of warmth which the body feels by the act of digestion without inflaming the blood or too greatly increasing the pulse. The second, or cordial assistant, should rather increase the powers of the body than those of the heart, for the force of the heart may be increased to the detriment of health. This is evident from a weakness of the body being the consequence of the force of the heart being increased in an inflammatory fever. And with regard to what is taken in the afternoon requiring a restorative nutriment, it is necessary that it should be light, pure and wholesome, lest its solidity and heaviness should oppress the bowels at a time when their tone is relaxed by recent fatigue and digestion. These qualities being the most proper to produce fresh animal spirits are the most fit to be taken when a new accession of them is necessary. It has been observed those are the most robust whose serum resembles most the white of an egg. It has therefore been most rationally concluded that the origin of the animal spirits is from aliments capable of being changed into a similar substance, but so attenuated by incalation as to concrete by fire. For this reason, the greatest support of the spirits is afforded by light and nourishing meats and drinks, which in taste and smell are even agreeable to infants. All cordials and aromatics are consequently the most proper for such purposes, and at such times, when heavier foods would impress, instead of recruiting, the exhausted solids and fluids. It is therefore Boerhaave recommends such aromatics for the reviving and recruiting the animal spirits as having the most pleasing taste and smell. Agreeably to this opinion, Dr. Solander employed his researches to form an afternoon beverage of such herbs as should possess all the above cardiac and balsamic qualities. The use of the sanative tea between dinner and supper operates as the most reviving and wholesome aliment that can, at such a time, be possibly taken. An inquiry having been made into the nature, preparation and manner of using the sanative tea, there only remains to conclude this second part of the essay with the consideration of its effects. End of section 6 Section 7 Effects From the view that has been taken of the nature, preparation and manner of using, the salutary effects are most clearly and easily to be ascertained. As the basis of this tea is the combined principle of the most balsamic oils, nutritious salts and animating sulphurs which the vegetable world produces, their effects must be proportionately salutary. And as their combination is such as to correct the pernicious qualities of each other, their conjoint effect must be the most wholesome that can possibly be administered for the health of human nature. As every simple, however specific in certain cases, possesses qualities that are pernicious in other respects, it has been the first principle of physical inquiry not only to find the basis of a medicine, but to form compounds or ingredients that corrected the injurious tendency of each other. With this scientific principle, Dr. Solander having composed his sanative tea, has rendered it the most general specific in its effects of any medicinal aliment. This tea, affording a compound oil, which is formed of the most aromatic vegetables the earth affords, it is no wonder its effects, like honey, should approach so near a general specific. The invaluable oils, uniting with the sulphurs of the sanative tea, 
recruit, soften and lubricate the juices, diminish the too great elasticity, dryness and crispness of the nervous fibres and afford the exhausted liquids fresh supplies. Their effects are consequently exceedingly restorative in all cases where the force of the fibres and the vessels are too strong, the circulation too rapid, and the blood too attenuated or diminished, as it prevents the too quick action of the solids and the too rapid motion of the blood, the body is nourished and the mind prepared for the refreshment of sleep when the approach of night invites to repose. In spitting of blood, its effects are particularly beneficial. The oil being easily detached from the earth of the plant is, in such cases, exceedingly nutritive, and by its checking the stimulation and sheathing the acrimony of the humours, the blood is replenished with the most healing and balsamic virtues. In pleurises, ulcers and abscesses of the lungs, hectic fevers, dry coughs, night sweats and difficulty of breathing, the balsamic oil and sulphur of this tea is most salutary. The dropsical, phlegmatic, corpulent, cathetic and all, such as are in their stamina relaxed, will find the greatest relief in its constant use. And to those who are emaciated, either from hereditary or acquired disease, it is particularly beneficial. In seasons when experience informs us that the blood requires cleansing and attenuating, this tea will be of considerable service to the healthy as well as the diseased. By these means, the constitution will be preserved and restored from all those chronic and acute afflictions which are the consequences of acrimonious humours and foulness of blood. As this tea produces the effects of cleansing the stomach, promoting digestion, diluting the chyle, and invigorating the whole viscera, it should be constantly drank by those who live freely. Unlike most medicinal applications, this tea requires no previous preparation of the body. Such are its nature and progression of effects that it first renders the body in a state suitable to receive succeeding benefits. Nor is it dangerous, like mineral waters, to which persons afflicted with nervous complaints generally resort. Persons suffering acute or inflammatory diseases, or who have their vessels too greatly constringed, need not be under the apprehensions of suffering scirrhosis, or even death, which is the confluence of drinking, in such cases, mineral waters. But, on the contrary, they may expect to receive, from the use of the sanative tea, the most beneficial effects, not only in the above, but also in the gout and rheumatism, from its moderate use producing a gentle perspiration. To account for the variety of salutary effects that this valuable discovery produces, we shall now proceed to consider its operation as a medicine and an aliment which will afford the most convincing and conclusive arguments that can be possibly adduced in favour of its sanative qualities. To consider its medicinal properties or effects, it is necessary to state in what manner it acts first upon the solids, next upon the fluids, and lastly, how it operates upon both together. For on these three principles, the power and quality of a medicine solely depend. In acting upon the solids, it either alters their texture and cohesion, or, by diluting the canals, change the figure of the sides. But a medicine acting upon fluids only, either alters their properties, or brings them out of the body. All medicines, however, act as well upon the solids as the fluids, for the latter can scarcely be altered without in some degree affecting the former. As all medicines derive the greatest qualities from their filling, evacuating or altering the smallest parts, the sanative tea possesses the most restorative properties 
from its action upon the smallest nervous vessels, and not in the arteries, veins, glands, lymphatic and adipose vessels. Thus, as all augmentation and accretion of the greater depend on the extension of the smallest lateral vessels, which are nervous turbuli, the nutrition and restitution of what is wasted must be considerably derived from the constant use of this beverage, morning and evening. From this the medicinal effects of the tea upon the solids are found to be consistent with the first of physical principles. For the nutrition of the solids, which is made by the application of any part to the place of a wasted part, is always affected in the smallest canals, of which the greater consist. And as every salutary change of the fluids is made in the smallest vessels, the sanative tea possessing the power of conveying nutrition into the most minute channels of the body, the liquids must derive from it the greatest renovation. From this combined effect upon the solids and liquids, the strength of the greater vessels is increased, and thus is the whole aggregate body invigorated, for every artery derives its energy from its sides, which are composed of the minutest vessels. To enter into a complete detail of its medicinal principles would require a volume itself. We must therefore avoid any further inquiry of its effects as a physical remedy in order to leave a few lines for its consideration as an aliment. The qualities of an aliment chiefly depend on their nature affording that nourishment which is proper to the time of taking and the state of the body. Indeed, Without their possessing these relative properties, either meats or drinks are injurious instead of beneficial. For this reason, physical necessity, more than tyrant custom, has caused a thinner aliment to be taken in the morning and evening than what forms the meals of dinner and supper. This necessity arises from the state of the body being in the morning just recovering its spirits from a comparative state of relaxation and imbecility, and in the afternoon from the stomach being enfeebled by recent digestion. That the body, immediately after sleep, is in a relaxed state, may be perceived by the perturbation the spirits experience from any surprise or violent action instantly succeeding. Fits and faintings have frequently been the consequence of persons of quick sensibilities being wakened. In such a state of relative debility, gross and solid food must oppress the spirits and thus render the body incapable of deriving nourishment from such an untimely aliment. But if what is taken is light, pure and apt for producing chyle, the stomach being capable of digesting it, must turn it to the most wholesome nutrition. To attain this end, foreign teas, from their lightness, have been universally adopted. But, as we have found, from their nature, how ill-adapted they are to be given when the nerves are already too weak to bear their violent astringency, such should be used as are possessed of the most nutrition without a tendency to irritate the relaxed fibrilli. When the stomach is enfeebled by recent digestion in the afternoon, to take then another meal of solid aliment must evidently tend to depress the digestive powers and thus prevent the body from having that nourishment it might receive from a lighter aliment. The sanative tea being found from the preceding inquiries to possess the most active, subtle, penetrating, and balsamic compound oils, salts, and sulphurs, which pervade, without irritation, the minutest canals, must afford that species of aliment which the body in a morning and afternoon requires. While it attenuates, it restores the tone and substance of the juices, strengthens the solids, invigorates every natural function, and thus affords the means of enjoying all the comfort that a healthy body 
and a happy mind can bestow. End of section 7 Advertisements Dr. Solander's Sanative English Tea, universally approved and recommended by the most eminent physicians in preference to foreign tea, as the most pleasing and powerful restorative in all nervous disorders, hitherto discovered. Our first aliment at breakfast being designed to recruit the waste of the body from the night's insensible perspiration, an inquiry is important whether India tea, which the faculty unanimously concur in pronouncing a species of slow poison that unnerves and wears the substance of the solids, is adequate to such a purpose. If it be not, the inquiry is further necessary to find out a proper substitute. If an apozem, professionally approved and recommended for its nutritive qualities as a general aliment, has claimed to public attention, certainly Dr. Solander's tea, so sanctioned, is the most proper morning and afternoon's beverage. Prepared for the proprietor by an eminent botanist. Sold wholesale and retail by the proprietor's agent, Mr. T. Golding, at his warehouse for patent medicines, number 42, Cornhill, London, and retail by Mr. F. Newbury, number 45, St. Paul's Churchyard, Messrs. Bailey's, Cockspur Street, Mr. W. Bacon, number 150, Oxford Street, Mr. Overton, number 47, New Bond Street, and by Mr. J. Fuller, Covent Garden, near the Hammams. Also, by the vendors of patent medicines in every city and town in England, Ireland, and Scotland. Sold in packets at two shillings, nine pence, and in canisters at ten shillings, six pence each, duty included. Liberal allowance for exportation to country vendors and to schools. The native and exotic plants which chiefly compose Dr. Solander's tea being gathered and dried with peculiar attention to the preserving of their sanative virtues must render them far more efficacious than many similar preparations which by being reduced to powder must have those qualities destroyed they might otherwise possess a packet of this tea at two shillings nine pence is sufficient to breakfast one person a month direction for making dr solander's tea two or three teaspoonfuls of this tea being put into a teapot or a covered basin pour boiling water upon it and let it remain a short time in a state of infusion after using milk and sugar agreeably to the taste drink it moderately warm a few teacups full are sufficient for breakfast tea in the afternoon or any other time a person may think proper the native and exotic plants which chiefly compose this tea being gathered and dried with peculiar attention to the preserving their sanative virtues must render them far more efficacious than many similar preparations which by being reduced to powder must have those qualities destroyed they might otherwise possess a caution the high estimation in which dr solander's tea is held by the first circles of fashion as a general beverage the many cures it has affected and the pleasantness of its flavour having induced several unprincipled persons to prepare and vend a base and spurious preparation under a similar title the proprietor in justice to the known efficacy of this tea and to secure his property from further depredations has thought proper to have an engraved copper plate affixed to the canisters and packets of the genuine and original preparation of dr solander's sanative english tea this plate being entered at stationer's hall as the act directs august twentieth seventeen ninety one will subject such persons as imitate the same to a consequent prosecution the public are therefore cautioned from purchasing any article but what is distinguished by the said plate and to observe thereon the words specified as above of its being entered according to act of parliament end of section eight Dr. Solander's Tea, Part 1 This celebrated tea is particularly efficacious in most inward wasting, loss of appetite, hysterical disorders, and indigestion, depression of spirits, trembling or shaking of the hands or limbs, obstinate coughs, shortness of breath, 
and consumptive habits it purifies the blood eases the most violent pains of the head and stomach and is a wonderful assuager of the excruciating pains of the gout and rheumatism by promoting gentle perspiration by the nobility and gentry this tea is much admired as a fashionable breakfast being pleasant to the taste and smell gently astringing the fibres of the stomach and giving them that proper tensity which is requisite to a good digestion and nothing can be better adapted to help and nourish the constitution after late hours or making too free with wine this sanative tea is highly esteemed in the east and west indies being unlike india tea which the faculty unanimously concur in pronouncing a species of slow poison that unnerves and wears the substance of the solids on the contrary this nourishes and invigorates the nervous system acts as a general restorative cordial upon debilitated constitutions and is a sovereign remedy in bilious complaints contracted in hot climates in the measles and smallpox nothing need be given but a plenty of this tea drank warm at night it promotes refreshing rest and as such is a regular afternoon's beverage with many aged and infirm persons being of peculiar service to children and such who are weakly many parents and others having the care and education of females exclude the use of any other than this salubrious tea by the studious and sedentary this celebrated tea is justly considered as a mental panacea from its sovereign efficacy in removing complaints of the head invigorating the mind improving the memory and enlivening the imagination the proofs of efficacy of dr solander's tea being so numerous would far exceed the limitations of a pamphlet the public are therefore required to accept the following abridged list of cures as specimens case one to the proprietor of dr solander's tea having long languished under a severe depression of spirits an almost continual cough and to all appearance a confirmed consumption being afflicted with violent pains in my head and breast together with a total lassitude of body and limbs i was so weak and emaciated that all my friends and acquaintance apprehended i could not survive many weeks in that unhappy condition an eminent physician recommended to me your sanative english tea in the use of which i persevered for several weeks with the happiest effect and am now perfectly cured by that salutary and invaluable medicine happy in the opportunity of contributing my endeavors to alleviate the distresses of humanity i hereby authorize you to publish my case with my earnest recommendation of your sanative tea to all persons afflicted with nervous and other consumptive disorders and am sir your humble servant nicholas sandys n b my near relation samuel sandys esq number sixty one burner street and many of my friends will testify to the truth of the above case two mrs jones of hammersmith was for several years afflicted with a bilious and nervous complaint being recommended by a friend who in an obstinate cough attended with spitting of blood had experienced the peculiar efficacy of dr solander's tea was at last persuaded to make trial of it when in a few months she was perfectly restored to health and spirits by the use of this celebrated tea case three mr bryant number seven king street bethnal green for twenty years was violently afflicted with a nervous disorder but by the constant drinking the sanative english tea is now enjoying a good state of health case four captain r smith of liverpool after a severe nervous fever was very much afflicted with violent pains in his breast attended with a continual cough and excruciating headache which entirely deprived him of rest and reduced him to a mere skeleton being persuaded to drink dr solander's tea was recovered to health and strength by that salubrious panacea case five to the proprietor of dr solander's tea for some years past i had been violently afflicted with a slow nervous fever attended by a continual headache a total loss of appetite and a very bad digestion by which i was reduced to a deplorable state of languor and dejection of spirit after being attended by many doctors and taking a variety of medicines my husband mr john todd hearing from several persons with whom he was acquainted of the wonderful effects your excellent tea had done in nervous disorders in various families with whom 
in his extensive acquaintance he was well known urged me much to drink the tea which i began in the morning for breakfast and in a few days i found myself much better and was much pleased with so grateful a remedy i continued it for some time and i do assure you that i am now entirely recovered and enjoy a perfect state of health without any medical assistance whatever i am therefore prompted to send you this in gratitude for the benefit i have received requesting you will make what use of it you think proper as it may be of the same benefit to others i am sir your very humble servant francis todd rum and brandy warehouse number eight little carter lane doctor's commons february twentieth seventeen ninety case six to the proprietor of the sanative tea when i arrived in england some time ago i was distressed with a severe depression of the spirits a very violent cough and as all my friends thought in a declining consumptive habit of body my brother hearing the efficacy of your sanative tea much praised bought me a canister and begged i would use it according to the directions given with it which i did and had a teapot of it standing at my bedside every night for as i was very restless and very feverish drinking it at intervals and likewise in the morning before it was all out i was entirely recovered and have at this time good spirits good appetite and good health i therefore recommend it much i am sir etc mary malarkey number eleven york street london road september twenty ninth seventeen ninety two case seven to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea a near relation of mine being afflicted with a violent nervous disorder owing to a fright which happened to her in her lying in so much so as nearly to deprive her of reason her intellects were for some time very much impaired and she was reduced to a state of despondency she was attended by many eminent physicians and took many of her apothecary's draughts etc but without success until she was persuaded to try your sanative tea by several of her acquaintances who had proved its good qualities which she made use of six weeks and in which time she found herself perfectly recovered from such alarming disorder in justice to so valuable and elegant a medicine i cannot omit giving you this information that it may be published for the benefit of the community at large being fully persuaded of its excellent qualities i am sir etc richard andrews number twenty cross street surrey october sixteenth seventeen ninety two case eight to the proprietor of the sanative tea for a long time i was frequently afflicted with a nervous disorder in my head and stomach was exceedingly ill and low-spirited and often confined to my bed i had a variety of things prescribed for me by gentlemen of the faculty but without effect my disorder still returning till your sanative tea was recommended to me i resolved to try it and it so much pleased me in taste and satisfaction of drinking that i made it my constant morning and evening tea and continued it for some time and quickly found my health better my spirits good and have now entirely got rid of by its means all my illness and am in good health therefore i am glad to send this information in justice to the virtues of the sanative tea recommending it to every one who may be afflicted with any such dreadful complaints i labored under i remain sir your humble servant mary smith mistress of the school blackfriars school near ludgate hill november sixteenth seventeen ninety two case nine to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea about twelve months ago my daughter was afflicted with violent pains in her stomach occasioned as was supposed by drinking strong green tea for breakfast without eating therewith i had the assistance of several gentlemen of the faculty but to no purpose as her complaint grew worse almost daily and it was the general opinion that she was in a decline anxious for the safety of my child i tried many advertised medicines without success till seeing in the county chronicle the many cures performed by your sanative tea i wrote to a friend in london to procure me some of it he readily acquiesced and sent me a few packets of the tea as a present in a short time her complaint was much abated and continuing the use of it a few weeks she was restored to perfect health in justice to the merits of your tea you have my consent to make whatever use you please of this token of acknowledgment i remain sir your obliged humble servant fred blakely barsford near needham suffolk march tenth seventeen ninety three case ten to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea having been afflicted with obstructions 
attended with a continual cough and violent pains in my head and breast i applied to many physicians and apothecaries without finding relief till i drank your sanative tea which has entirely cured me i think it my duty to send you this acknowledgment in justice to you and the public at large i am sir etc anne royal number sixty three st john street near the green walk christ church surrey march eighteenth seventeen ninety three case eleven to the proprietor of the sanative tea being much afflicted with a slow fever very nervous and much subject to fits a violent oppression at my stomach and total loss of appetite i was continually taking physic of various descriptions but found no relief having heard your sanative tea highly praised i resolved to try it and found myself in a short time much better i have continued drinking it ever since and at present enjoy so perfect a state of health that i cannot sufficiently express my gratitude for the benefit i have experienced i therefore send you this recommending it much to every person so afflicted with illness as i was giving you full liberty to make this known as you may think proper i am etc catherine clover ormond place queen square bloomsbury march twenty fourth seventeen ninety three case twelve to the proprietor of the english sanative tea having had recourse to several medicines and prescriptions for internal weakness and indigestion without the desired effect i was advised to make trial of your sanative tea as a medicine i accordingly furnished myself with two parcels and found it very agreeable and pleasant and in a short time i had the satisfaction of feeling the good effects of this pleasing and salutary medicine and to confirm the services received from it i am determined for the future to drink it instead of foreign teas because i think it more grateful than anything yet presented to the public as a stomatic therefore in justice to your valuable discovery for the public good you are welcome to communicate this information to the world at large with the sincerest wishes for the general use of your excellent tea i am sir etc richard edwards number thirty seven baldwin's gardens holborn june thirteenth seventeen ninety three case thirteen to the proprietor of the sanative tea being very much afflicted with a violent headache for a good many years i some time ago heard a great praise of the sanative tea i tried it and thought it did me good and by continuing the use of it it has entirely taken away my old headache and i find myself much better and am now quite well indeed it has done me more good than i could expect as the headache is particularly our family complaint i likewise recommended it to my brother james robertson of bradfield essex and it has had the same good effects on him also my sister mrs shibley of battlebridge has experienced its salutary effects therefore in justice to so excellent a thing i send you this hoping others troubled with a constitutional headache will make use of it i am sir your obedient servant ratcliffe robertson number ten great shire lane temple bar june twenty sixth seventeen ninety three case fourteen to the proprietor of the sanative tea about two years ago i was attacked with a nervous disorder in my head which violently afflicted my whole frame i had no rest and oftentimes for want of sleep at intervals lost my senses being much troubled with frights and startings the disorder increased till most of my friends expected i should soon die i took many things without benefit till an acquaintance recommended me to use the sanative tea i began to drink it in the night being always very thirsty i thought in two or three nights that i was easier i therefore continued it and not only drank it in the night but used it constantly and left off drinking india tea i gradually got better and am now quite recovered having got rid of headache startings etc i therefore wish to recommend it for its excellence to all my sex and beg you will accept of this hoping it may be useful i am sir your humble servant mary shaw number twenty four cross street st george's field july tenth seventeen ninety three case fifteen to the proprietor of dr solander's tea induced by a friend of mine to make use of your tea as an excellent medicine for the loss of appetite bad digestion and great relaxation of the whole frame with which i had been afflicted a long time i have found more relief from it than from any other medicine i have yet had recourse to and am convinced it has qualities superior to anything of the kind and considering it as worthy of public attention i give you my approbation of the services 
it has done me i am your humble servant john middleton pencil maker number eleven turnigan lane snow hill july nineteenth seventeen ninety three case sixteen to the proprietor of dr solander's tea hearing of the virtues of your tea in nervous complaints and indigestions and being among my friends much persuaded to try it i soon found by drinking it for breakfast the good effects arising from it your sanative tea having operated entirely to my wish from its pleasing as well as its medicinal qualities i continue to use it at least once a day and as a means of disclosing its virtues shall continue to recommend it in the circle of my acquaintance your humble servant peter capper number fourteen lambeth walk august eighth seventeen ninety three case seventeen to the proprietor of the english sanative tea a servant of mine having been in a continual state of pain from what the doctors deemed a rheumatic complaint for the space of eight months and appearing to be of a consumptive habit of body attended with a total depression of spirits a perpetual cough and extreme weakness of limbs which threatened her dissolution hearing frequently of the surprising efficacy of your sanative tea i bought some for her and the happy effects it has produced urges me strongly to speak in its great praise therefore i send you this hoping your case may be of service to make the virtues of your sanative tea universally known i am sir etc joseph swallow number three clarence place st george's southwark august twentieth seventeen ninety three case eighteen to the proprietor of the sanative tea being afflicted with a nervous headache and trembling of the hands lowness of spirits and bad appetite a friend of mine wished very much i would drink the sanative english tea which upon drinking instead of other tea for breakfast i found myself much better and am now quite well my hands being perfectly steady which is of a great advantage to me i being a writing stationer besides my appetite is good and i feel myself in every respect so well that i am persuaded i do good to the community in begging you will make this publicly known yours etc j clark number sixteen newcastle court butcher row temple bar september sixth seventeen ninety three case nineteen to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea for many years i had been violently afflicted with acute pains in my head a nervous disorder and lowness of spirits and took many medicines from apothecaries but found no benefit till lately a friend speaking very much in praise of the sanative tea it induced me to drink it instead of other tea and i have found it so happily relieved me that i am induced to send you this to recommend it for such complaints to all nervous people i am etc rosanna wynne number sixty two south audley street grosvenor square september tenth seventeen ninety three case twenty to the proprietor of the sanative tea i cannot withhold my praise of your sanative tea having received so much benefit by its efficacy for having been a long time oppressed with a severe headache and low spirits and little or no appetite i was recommended to drink your tea which to my great surprise very soon restored me to health i therefore wish this to be made public for the good of others alice mason number eighteen upper ground blackfriars bridge september eighteenth seventeen ninety three case twenty one to the proprietor of the sanative tea mrs hayden being much affected with an oppression at her stomach very low spirits and other complaints attending a nervous disorder for a long time past after taking various prescriptions of her doctors without effect she was persuaded to try your sanative tea which proved most salutary and she is now perfectly restored to health and takes this method to recommend it to ladies troubled with the same complaints i am sir your obedient servant robert hayden sadler knightsbridge september nineteenth seventeen ninety three case twenty two to the proprietor of dr solander's tea i was a considerable time much afflicted with a nervous fever and depression of spirits till hearing of the efficacy of your sanative tea in similar complaints induced me to make trial of it by which in a few weeks i was restored to perfect health i am sir your humble servant r jones aldersgate street november twenty seventh seventeen ninety three case twenty three to the proprietor of the sanative tea my mother having been afflicted for some time past 
with a nervous complaint and a bad headache she took several medicines without effect till a lady of her acquaintance recommended to her your sanative tea and advised her to drink it instead of green or bohea tea which advice she followed and as it relieved her of those complaints i send you this in order that the good qualities of this tea may be known to those afflicted with similar complaints i am sir your obedient servant george quinn hydrometer maker number twelve london road september nineteenth seventeen ninety three case twenty four to the proprietor of the sanative tea some time ago being recommended to drink your sanative tea for a troublesome headache and a nervous disorder in my stomach i am so pleased with its good qualities and efficacy in removing those complaints that i am induced to recommend it as a restorative in such cases i am etc william philby number three pilgrim street ludgate hill october first seventeen ninety three case twenty five to the proprietor of the sanative tea my business obliging me for many years to be concerned in spirituous liquors and under the unavoidable necessity of drinking too much i have suffered greatly from the ill effects of the same till recommended to drink your sanative tea which after a little time did me so much good that i am induced to wish that every person would drink the tea who have suffered the same infirmities from the too frequent use of spirituous liquors i therefore send you this in hopes others may be benefited as i have been i am sir etc joseph wells guy earl of warwick upper ground blackfriars road october seventh seventeen ninety three case twenty six to the proprietor of the sanative tea about six weeks ago i was attacked with a violent sore throat and fever being attended by my apothecary and taking a number of medicines which he sent me a physician was advised to be called in but nothing they prescribed did me any good and the doctor gave me up as entirely lost i was then pressed by a relation to drink a quantity of the sanative tea which i immediately did and continued through the night i found after a long sleep that i was much better i therefore continued it for a day or two afterwards and i was still better and better and in the space of three weeks i found myself restored to perfect health i therefore recommend it strongly to all who may be attacked in the same manner and am most assuredly convinced that the sanative tea contains many efficacious and excellent properties from the great benefit i have so astonishingly experienced by it i am sir etc samuel robinson number fifteen clifford's inn october eighth seventeen ninety three case twenty seven to the proprietor of dr solander's tea your sanative tea being recommended to me for a nervous disorder and a consumptive habit of body with which i was afflicted a considerable time i accordingly gave it a trial and found myself in a short time so much better that i continue to drink it regularly and am now in exceedingly good health in gratitude to so excellent a remedy i send you this acknowledgment and am sir your humble servant john lamb clifford's inn october twelfth seventeen ninety three case twenty eight to the proprietor of dr solander's tea for some years past i have been afflicted with a nervous disorder attended with a bad headache and violent spasms in the stomach i was for a long time attended by an apothecary and took much medicine till taking to drink the sanative tea which i heard was sold in cornhill it did me much good and so pleased me in taste that i continued the use of it and am now quite well you may as you think fit make use of this my poor praise i am sir your humble servant john wanock number two fountain court katiaton street october fourteenth seventeen ninety three case twenty nine to the proprietor of the sanative english tea i was suddenly seized with a violent fever and attended by a physician but grew worse my friends on inquiry the next day found me very bad and so i remained the whole of that night in the morning a neighboring gentlewoman stepped in made me some of your sanative tea which as she afterwards informed me i drank greedily and asked for more which was given me i then fell into a pleasing sleep and on waking found myself so refreshed and well that i am determined to drink it constantly in gratitude for the benefit i have experienced from your tea you may depend upon my recommendation and custom i am sir your most humble servant george brown white lion street pentonville islington october sixteenth seventeen ninety three End of section 9
section ten case thirty to the proprietor of solander's tea being afflicted with a violent headache a considerable time till hearing of the sanative tea having cured many persons of that complaint i was induced to make trial of it and accordingly sent for some which i like so well that i continued to drink it every morning for breakfast and i declare since drinking that tea and leaving off green tea i have been entirely freed from my former complaint if therefore this my acknowledgment of its efficacy should induce any of my sex who are so liable to that so general a disorder i don't doubt of its doing them as much service as i have experienced i am sir your humble servant e mackerel number one basing lane november twenty one seventeen ninety three case thirty one to the proprietor of the english tea it is with the utmost pleasure i inform you that my sister who has lingered these eight months under a decline of the most alarming kind is now perfectly restored to health by drinking frequently and regularly your sanative english tea i am sir your respectful servant t i upton watchmaker number eight bell yard temple bar december fifteenth seventeen ninety three case thirty two to the proprietor of dr solander's tea it is the duty of every individual member of society whose health may be renovated by the use of any medicine freely to communicate its efficacy for the public good in order that it may be better known and disseminated amongst his fellow-creatures being from the nature of my profession my inclination perhaps also conducing that way necessarily accustomed to a sedentary life i became the unhappy victim of all those horrible maladies incident to a debility of the nervous system augmented by inattention to myself accompanied with a depression of spirits verging to an almost absolute despondency a gentleman whose goodness and philanthropy eminently characterize him recommended to me dr solander's tea and happily by the use of it i have experienced the most unspeakable relief and my health is completely re-established my nerves have assumed their natural tone and my animal spirits that hilarity they formerly possessed with all the fervor of gratitude for the salutary effects of this incomparable tea i sincerely recommend its use to those who may be afflicted in the same way i am sir and so forth butler fitzgerald attorney at law and solicitor in chancery december twenty seventh seventeen ninety three case thirty three to the proprietor of the sanative tea i was for some time supposed to be in a decline and medicine had no effect till seeing an advertisement of a cure performed by your sanative tea in a case similar to my own i made trial of it and received so much benefit from its use that i take this opportunity to acknowledge its merits in having restored me to perfect health i am sir your humble servant benjamin baker clifford's inn coffee-house january three seventeen ninety four case thirty four to the proprietor of dr solander's tea two of my children being very ill i was recommended to try dr solander's tea which in a short time did them so much good that i am induced to send you this believing it to be a most excellent remedy for many disorders i am sir your most obedient servant e allen number thirteen cross street hatton garden february two seventeen ninety four case thirty five to the proprietor of the sanative english tea having been for a long time troubled with a bad cough violent cold a poor appetite and in a very low nervous way i took much physic but found no relief till several of my acquaintance speaking greatly in praise of the sanative tea and recommending it particularly i drank it for some time and finding it do me so much good i continued the use of it and am now perfectly restored to health i therefore send you this acknowledgment of its efficacy i am sir your most obedient servant john wheeler number seven lamb's conduit passage red lion square 
february eighteenth seventeen ninety four case thirty six to the proprietor of dr solander's tea one of my daughters being lately very ill with an intermitting headache a nervous fever and seemingly in a decline at the particular desire of a friend i was induced to buy some of the sanative tea which she continued to drink for some time and i am happy in this opportunity to acknowledge that it has perfectly recovered her i am sir your obliged humble servant james gent number fourteen watling street may two seventeen ninety four case thirty seven to the proprietor of the sanative english tea being much afflicted with violent pains in my stomach and bowels attended with a loss of appetite i was recommended to try your english tea which by the time i had taken three packets restored me to perfect health i therefore send you this as a testimony of its virtues and am sir your humble servant w jordan the corner of harper street red lion square may eighth seventeen ninety four case thirty eight to the proprietor of the english tea i was a long time afflicted with a nervous disorder attended with such lowness of spirits that at times rendered me incapable of business by the advice of a friend i made trial of your tea which entirely removed my complaint and now i enjoy a good state of health i remain sir your humble servant w m faircloth number fifty little russell street near duke street bloomsbury may twelfth seventeen ninety four case thirty nine to the proprietor of dr solander's tea having been a considerable time afflicted with a nervous headache attended with violent pains in my stomach for which i took several medicines without experiencing any beneficial effect being tired of such i bought some of your sanative tea which by using a short time i experienced such a material change in my complaint as induced me to continue it and am now free from my former pains and nervous affections i remain sir your obedient servant richard loveday number one o five bermondsey street may twenty seventeen ninety four case forty to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea my wife being much afflicted with a nervous complaint a bad appetite and depression of spirits she was recommended to drink the english tea which in a short time restored her to health i therefore send you this acknowledgment of its merit i am sir your obedient servant r clark number nine ward's place islington june eighteenth seventeen ninety four case forty one to the proprietor of dr solander's tea having heard your sanative tea spoke of with much praise and it being recommended to me by a friend who had experienced its efficacy in eruptions of the skin i was induced to make a trial of it to my daughter who had frequently been troubled with a similar complaint and am happy to inform you that she has received much benefit from its use and make no doubt that in a short time it will have the desired effect so long wished for and am sir your humble servant john roberts prospect place newington surrey june thirty seventeen ninety four case forty two to the proprietor of the english tea being in the liquor trade and liable to live irregular i contracted a violent pain and trembling of my limbs which often rendered me incapable of attending to business by taking your tea at night and for breakfast it has entirely removed my complaint i therefore send you this as a testimony of its good qualities i remain sir and so forth james rafferty number twelve cross street hatton garden july twenty eighth seventeen ninety four case forty three to the proprietor of dr solander's tea i was considerable time afflicted with a consumptive cough and inward wasting which induced me to have recourse to many gentlemen of the faculty without receiving any benefit from their advice or medicine at last i was recommended to try your sanative tea and am happy to inform you that a few packets of it entirely removed my cough and at present find myself in as good a state of health as ever i enjoyed i am sir and so forth thomas gallant number ten peter lane west smithfield 
august four seventeen ninety four case forty four to the proprietor of the sanative tea i have been for ten years very much afflicted with a rheumatic gout for which i have taken much medicine without being relieved fortunately i was advised last march to try dr solander's tea the first two packets i took greatly eased my pains and the three next parcels cured me since the pains not returning you have my authority to make this public for the good of society i remain sir and so forth james johnston lambeth butts twelfth august seventeen ninety four case forty five to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea having for a long time suffered greatly with a severe bilious complaint i was persuaded to make trial of your sanative tea from which i have experienced such good effects as induces me to recommend it to such who are afflicted with a similar disorder i am and so forth rachel james august twelfth number two cloisters near smithfield case forty six to the proprietor of dr solander's tea i should not think i discharged my duty to the public were i to conceal for a moment the great benefit i have received from solander's tea as well as two of my children who were weekly for some months after the measles my own case was violent trembling of my hands attended with lowness of spirits for which i took various prescriptions from many eminent of the faculty without any visible benefit till by the advice of one of them i took to drink your tea which in a few weeks entirely cured me finding it so efficacious and withal so pleasant to the taste i gave it to my children to drink who i am happy to say are perfectly recovered i remain sir and so forth w m hoskins croydon august thirteenth seventeen ninety four case forty seven to the proprietor of the english sanative tea being long afflicted with a nervous complaint and great depression of spirits i was advised to try the sanative tea from which i received so much benefit as induces my recommending it as a pleasant and comfortable remedy i am sir and so forth arabella de borax number forty nine gloucester street queen square bloomsbury august thirteenth seventeen ninety four case forty eight to the proprietor of the sanative tea in justice to your sanative tea i approve of its utility in nervous hysterical disorders and lowness of spirits having seen its good effects in cases under my own inspection i also approve of it for children in the measles i am sir your humble servant and so forth james fell surgeon and apothecary number thirty six pratt's place camden town st pancras august fourteenth seventeen ninety four case forty nine to the proprietor of dr solander's tea having been for several years troubled with violent nervous headaches i had recourse to many remedies without effect till i tried the sanative tea a few packets of which effectually cured me i remain sir and so forth m lawson number seven new compton street august sixteenth seventeen ninety four case fifty to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea in gratitude for the benefit i have received from your tea i acknowledge its having recovered me from a bilious and nervous disorder with which i was afflicted i am sir and so forth ann martin pitt street black friars august eighteenth seventeen ninety four case fifty one to the proprietor of dr solander's tea i was for some years attacked with a violent cough which threatened a consumption for which i tried several medicines in vain till i used your sanative tea which has effectually cured me i am sir and so forth catherine brown bluewitz buildings fetter lane august twenty five seventeen ninety four case fifty two to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative english tea having been much troubled with a nervous disorder attended with a sick headache particularly after breakfast and tea i was strongly advised to try your english tea which by persevering in its use has recovered me from my complaints i remain sir yours and so forth f marshall duke's row somers town september twenty seventh seventeen ninety four case fifty three to the proprietor of dr solander's english tea 
being long afflicted with a slow nervous complaint that brought on such a debility of my frame as rendered me incapable of my business i was persuaded by a friend to the use of the sanative tea and purchased two packets from which i found great relief and by continuing its use am perfectly restored to health and strength i am sir and so forth h i dobson number sixty two kingsland road october sixteenth seventeen ninety four case fifty four to the proprietor of dr solander's tea your sanative tea having cured me of a violent bilious complaint with which i have been afflicted above six months induces me to send you this acknowledgment of its efficacy i am sir and so forth w m lane hackney terrace october twenty seventh seventeen ninety four case fifty five to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea being for some time past afflicted with a weakness at my stomach attended with a violent pain in my head i was recommended to make trial of your sanative tea which has removed my complaints and i would wish to recommend it to others for the same disorder i remain sir your humble servant h murick shore place hackney december three seventeen ninety four case fifty six to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative english tea my daughter being afflicted with violent pains in her head and stomach i purchased some of your tea which has entirely relieved her from her complaints i am sir and so forth james bennett bagnage marsh opposite the bull december tenth seventeen ninety four case fifty seven to the proprietor of dr solander's tea being greatly troubled with a weakness of stomach indigestion and loss of appetite i was strongly recommended to try the sanative tea which has had so good an effect in restoring me to health that i wish to be the means of promoting the more general use of it in all complaints of that nature i am sir and so forth l fegan number two union row london road st george's fields december thirty seventeen ninety four case fifty eight to the proprietor of the english tea sir my daughter being in a poor state of health in consequence of a weak and bilious stomach i was advised to try your sanative tea which produced so good an effect that i take this opportunity of acknowledging it and am sir your humble servant james jarvis number twenty one chapman street new road st george's in the east february eighteenth seventeen ninety five case fifty nine to the proprietor of dr solander's sanative tea sir being greatly afflicted with a violent headache and lowness of spirits i was recommended to the use of dr solander's tea which effectually cured me i am sir your obedient servant evan evans number seven winsay row st george's fields march twenty nine seventeen ninety five case sixty to the proprietor of dr solander's tea sir the considerable benefit i have received from your sanative tea in a nervous disorder with which i was afflicted induces me to send you this acknowledgment of its merit and am sir your very humble servant john richardson church street mile end april three seventeen ninety five k sixty one to the proprietor of dr solander's english tea sir your sanative english tea as a corrector of a weak and bilious stomach attended with loss of appetite with which i was long afflicted has proved so peculiarly efficacious that i wish it was more generally known by such as are troubled with that too common and cruel complaint i am sir your most humble servant richard cox number eight paradise street finsbury square april twelfth seventeen ninety five case sixty one to the proprietor of dr solander's tea sir being troubled with a depression of spirits in consequence of a bilious complaint and indigestion in justice to the merits of your tea in removing the phlegm from my stomach and enlivening my spirits i send you this acknowledgment of its virtues i am sir your humble servant robert gribble portland place walworth july fourth seventeen ninety five k sixty three to the proprietor of dr solander's tea sir after a long and severe illness my brother was afflicted with a nervous complaint 
attended with lowness of spirits being advised to drink your celebrated tea he has experienced so much benefit from its use that it is but justice to acknowledge its efficacy i am sir your most humble servant james gilbert charles street whitechapel k sixty four to the proprietor of the english tea sir i was a considerable time much afflicted with a bilious complaint and very nervous till fortunately hearing of the many cures performed by your sanative tea in similar complaints induced me to make trial of it and to persevere in its use i now find myself so perfectly restored to health that i shall embrace every opportunity to recommend it in the circle of my acquaintance i am sir your obedient servant william marsh seward street old street road july twenty seventeen ninety five case sixty five to the proprietor of the sanative tea sir i have the satisfaction to inform you that i have just cause to approve your sanative tea from its having cured me of a severe nervous headache after the unsuccessful prescriptions of several of the faculty i am sir your most obliged servant barbary star number six golden lane barbican august seventeenth seventeen ninety five k sixty six to the proprietor of the sanative tea sir a friend of mine having drank your sanative tea and approved it i was induced to try it and have experienced its efficacy in a bilious complaint i am sir your humble servant allan wilson corn chandler and so forth tottenham court road may fifteenth seventeen ninety five k sixty seven to the proprietor of dr solander's english tea sir in the course of my practice i have had several opportunities to observe the sanative efficacy of your english tea in nervous and bilious cases i also approve of its use in hysterical disorders and lowness of spirits and shall recommend for such i am sir your humble servant thomas langford apothecary strand near exeter change october sixteenth seventeen ninety five k sixty eight to the proprietor of the sanative tea sir from the benefit i have experienced in drinking your sanative tea for a bilious complaint bordering on the jauntest i send you this acknowledgment of its merit i am sir your obedient servant charles warwick number seventeen baker's buildings old bethlehem november twenty five seventeen ninety five case sixty nine to the proprietor of the english tea sir my apothecary mr thomas langford of the strand having prescribed my drinking dr solander's tea for a nervous fever and headache with which i was afflicted i persevered in its use some time and am now happily restored to health by that pleasant remedy i am sir your humble servant c richardson number nine mount row opposite the paragon deptford road november fourteenth seventeen ninety five k seventy to the proprietor of dr solander's tea sir i approve of your english tea as a general beverage particularly in nervous hysterical cases and for children in the measles and smallpox and shall recommend for such in the course of my practice i am sir your humble servant o faircuff surgeon and so forth beaumont street portland place january twenty five seventeen ninety six t golding wholesale agent to the proprietor of this tea respectfully informs the nobility gentry and the public in general that for convenience of the country it is appointed to be sold by mr and one principal vendor of medicines in every other city and town in england ireland and scotland the native and exotic plants which chiefly compose this tea being gathered and dried with a peculiar attention to the preserving their sanative virtues must render them far more efficacious than many similar preparations which by being reduced to powder must have those qualities destroyed they might otherwise possess a caution the high estimation in which dr solander's tea is held by the first circles of fashion as a general beverage the many cures it has effected 
and the pleasantness of its flavor having induced several unprincipled persons to prepare and vend a base and spurious preparation under a similar title the proprietor in justice to the known efficacy of this tea and to secure his property from further depredations has thought proper to have an engraved copper plate affixed to the canisters and packets of the genuine and original preparation of dr solander's sanative english tea this plate being entered at stationer's hall as the act directs august twenty seventeen ninety four will subject such persons as imitate the same to a consequent prosecution the public are therefore cautioned from purchasing any article but what is distinguished by the said plate and to observe thereon the words specified as above of its being entered according to act of parliament end of section ten end of a treatise on foreign teas by hugh smith